My name is Ron Victor. Come on up, guys. I am the uh, founder and CEO of Iodium. Before we start, I'm going to let them introduce themselves. But before they do that, I want to get a feel for what the interest in the audience is. So first of all, how many entrepreneurs in the house? Wonderful. How many of these entrepreneurs want to do stuff in smart factories? How many of those that want to do stuff in smart factories want to work on the software side versus, the, uh, let's say, software side only? Anyone in the hardware side? A few. OK. Very good. That's a good feel. I hope you guys got a look at what our audience is uh, today. So Venki, why don't you start with yourself? Introduce yourself, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Venki Nanyur. I manage the strategy and planning for Cisco's uh, core networking group. And IoT infrastructure group is one of the key areas of focus for us. Um, I have been uh, in the strategy role back from 2007, 2008 timeframe. And uh, I've seen IoT grow from you know, ruggedizing oh, yeah. everything on the networking front to where it is today. And manufacturing and smart factories also happens to be pre pretty close to my heart. I started with uh, manufacturing in my career. Thank you. Laurie? Hi, I'm Laurie Weigel. Um, I've been at Intel for a very, very long time and uh, spent the last uh, couple of years on assignment with what was McAfee. Um, no. My role now is to lead our IoT I security strategy. Right now. They're gonna swap. Keith, Keith Davies uh, from General Electric, and uh, so when I describe uh, some of the things we're doing, it's going to be through the digitization of manufacturing and uh, the, the transformation that we're doing in uh, being able to take manufacturing through software uh, to leverage cloud infrastructure. Which mic do you want me to use? This one or the one you're going to give me? That one? All right, very good. So let's start this. First question, Keith, why don't you take a stab at this and then we'll walk it down the rest. Could you paint the vision of factory of the future? What do you see from the GE front as the factory of the future? What, you know, shed some experience on that. Sure, absolutely. So for us, when we think of the factory of the future, we, we think about how do we enable uh, devices to, to be able to provide their data? So how do we provide that device connectivity? And, and so once we have that information, then we, then we are enabled to run analytics against it. So we're not only able to leverage the information coming from those machines, but we're able to aggregate it together. And we're able to then compare factories across the fleet against each other and, and look for best practices. And so we really see three different steps. We see being able to connect to the data, being able to think about aggregating that data together and provide visualization, and then the third step of being able to optimize that information. So, so that's one step. The second step associated with that is we see being able to move information from on-premise to the cloud so that as customers think about being able to run their operations, they're able to deploy solutions much faster, they're able to upgrade solutions much faster, and ultimately they're able to leverage the return on investment, they're able to, to realize that return on investment much faster. Thank you. Laurie, you want to take a stab at that? Yeah, so, so I think we would agree with the definition that Keith just, just described, but maybe would characterize that as more of a um, mid, near to midterm uh, kind of evolution of manufacturing. We've started to think about IoT even more generally beyond manufacturing as going through or uh, having three different kinds of implementation. One is connecting the unconnected, which Keith talked about. The other is having critical mass of smart and connected things. But the ultimate vision is to get to autonomous and software defined infrastructure. And I think that's particularly interesting in a factory setting where we can see some function virtualization and a lot of optimization that comes from that. So to me, it's uh, first and foremost, it's uh, integration and utilizing the power of integration of IT and OT, operational technologies, um, and driving far better business results and far better uh, business outcomes through that. 
So that will mean um, your IT and business systems are integrated and are talking, are making decisions, are driving decisions, along with greater visibility to your supply chain, your factory and you know, shop floor control systems, your quality control systems, and collaboration uh, that you have for your uh, business, uh, you know, lines of business. So it's bringing the essentially bringing the power of all these together to drive far better customer experience and bringing more flexibility and productivity to the business. Maybe, Venki, you can start with this. Which uh, verticals do you think in smart factories do you see a lot of traction in the near term? Like, do you see it in aerospace? Do you see it in oil and gas? Do you see it in refineries and you know, jet engines? Which kind of verticals in the smart manufacturing or smart factories areas are you seeing some traction or whatever? What is Cisco seeing in that space? Yeah, I mean, Cisco, initially, um, we had partnership with a couple of companies. And we were primarily focused on energy and oil and uh, gas industries uh, to start with. And off late, what we are seeing is we are seeing more and more penetration of this IoT technologies in discrete manufacturing as well. So you're seeing uh, you know, adoption of uh, IoT technologies for driving you know, your assembly lines or improving the productivity of machines by using, you know, driving automation of uh, maintenance activities. So you know, I, I'm seeing big adoption in discrete manufacturing as of now. Obviously, energy and oil and natural industries uh, you know, definitely happens to be one of the high areas of focus for us. Yeah, I, I would make a similar comment. I, I think it, we see t uptake in a lot of different industries. It's hard to you know, pick one or two even that uh, you would single out as being further along. I mean, everything from st steel mil mills to um, uh, airplane companies. I mean, it, it really is quite varied. Yeah, and in addition to those, we're also seeing an uptake in uh, CPG, consumer packaged goods, and also in food and beverage. And uh, it's a little bit different than in the discrete marketplace, where in the discrete vertical, what's happening in, uh, in the non-discrete side, but there's still quite an interest in being able to, to obtain data, to be able to run analytics, and, and to be able to, to ultimately increase productivity and efficiency. What are the main drivers of, of Smart Factory? Laura, you want to take a stab at that? You know, wh why do people even want to implement all this stuff? Why do we, they want, you know, we've talked about analytics, et cetera, but from a business side, if I'm the CEO of Alcoa, why do I care about making my smelter smarter? What's it going to do for me? Yeah, so I'm going to start with at sort of the high level, and then I'll give you an example. So, I mean, the, the overall benefits have to do with things like improving efficiency, in increasing throughput, reducing downtime, and even through the use of robotics, improving safety. Um, but those sound a little bit like platitudes. So let me give you an example. We actually kind of ate our own dog food um, in our Malaysia assembly test facility and did an end-to-end -end IoT implementation, partnering with Mitsubishi uh, for the test equipment uh, with Dell for a Hadoop cluster on the back end, a private cloud implementation, as well as um, a, a couple of other partners who helped us with the analytics piece of it. And we actually ended up with three different use cases that uh, demonstrated benefit. So one of them was reducing or improving the um, um, accuracy of the test equipment through the analytics, we were able to actually realize that the equipment had been failing more parts than it should have, and so we actually improved our yields there. Uh, the an analytics also helped us improve the behavior of the equipment, so it, incre it actually increased productivity, uh, fewer defects in the parts. And then the other thing that we ended up implementing there was some visualization uh, where we were then able to use a computer vision application to take the place of something that had been done manually uh, to, to really um, determine whether or not parts had failed. So three big areas of benefit and multiple million dollars um, that we could quantify. Keith? Your ex experience here? Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, very similarly, we've also done the same thing where we're eating our own dog food and uh, we're taking our software solutions and rolling them out across hundreds of GE manufacturing plants over the course of 2016. And, and uh, we're doing that, to, to answer your question, we're doing that because we see a tremendous savings. 
And as Lori mentioned, there's a, there's a savings associated with downtime. There's also a savings uh, associated with being able to optimize our suppliers and, uh, and how we're scheduling the, the flow of, of building a given part. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, uh, Laura mentioned user interface, and so we found a great opportunity to, within our GE transportation business, to provide iPads to both the, the uh, uh, supervisors, which is really not surprising that they would want an iPad, but also the operators. And so down to the operator level, they're using a, an iPad to, to provide their work instructions, which is making the entire process much more efficient. So all of this results in millions of, of dollars in savings uh, across our given factories. So there's a real bottom line impact. Venki? Yeah, so if I can add to that, you know, definitely at the highest level, you know, everybody is focused on uh, improved productivity, lower downtimes, and faster changeovers, faster decision making. So those are all the fundamental business drivers. So if you look at just uh, manufacturing, if you take example of, let's say, auto industry, in the past, uh, or even now, many of the companies uh, obviously are building products to stock, right? And then from there, companies like Tesla are moving to your building products to order, or you're actually configuring products to order, or you're engineering products to order. So, so these are all made possible only because of the power of you know, IoT and the smart factory concepts. So recently, Cisco won a deal with uh, one of the large uh, machine tools manufacturers. So essentially, the use case is they are using um, a Cisco switch, a recognized switch, as part of the machine control so that they can sense the vi machine vibrations and they're able to predict when the, when the machine requires maintenance. Uh, so, you know, consequently, obviously, they will improve the utilization of the machine and they reduce the downtime and there's a huge slew of benefits associated with that. Fabulous. I just want to add to a little bit to that. Um, the company I did prior to Iodium, we focused very heavily on aluminum smelters and copper refineries. And it's very interesting. You could go in there and try and pitch, oh, we'll make your smelter more efficient. You'll use lesser current. Your voltage will be lesser, so you'll use lesser power, et cetera. A lot of people don't get it. What they got was when I told them, I'll save you $3 million a year. Yeah. <laughs> right? So all the technology was, you know, I'll prevent a short circuit, I'll reduce PFCs, carbon emission will drop, you can do carbon trading, your, your usage of power will be a lot. None of that created any sense of, you know, yeah, let's talk to you, Ron. Moment I said, I'll save you $3 million bucks every year, everybody said, yeah, let's talk. So all the startups here, when you're positioning your technologies, you know, technology is great, but position it with the business value to the right decision makers. And that, I, mean, I think that will help you considerably. What we are seeing in our company is now, four years after I did that, it's become a C-level agenda. So the CEO says, we are going to digitize our organization, right? It's no more bottoms up only. It's bottoms up and top down. So you're in a better spot. But if you put the business value, quantify it well, cater to the right person, that'll help. On that Sh note, show me the money. <laughs> that's right, show me the money. That's uh, really, really important. On that note, who do you guys think, I mean, when you're a startup, right? You're a struggling startup, you're dealing with Caterpillar, you're dealing with Halliburton, you're dealing with uh, Schlumberger, you're dealing with Chevron. I mean, how does a startup, who are the decision makers here? How does a startup go and penetrate these organizations as far as, you know, I have this cool technology that's gonna help you save all this money and do whatever it is. Any, any takers on that? Do you guys wanna take a stab at that or? So maybe I can take a stab at that. So this is still an evolving field. Um, so IT and OT convergence is still at various levels of maturity in different organizations. So you obviously have multiple buying centers that you're dealing with. So, so from an IT perspective, you're still, you know, high tech companies like Cisco, obviously we have the relationship with the IT organizations and the CIOs and CIO organizations of, uh, you know, uh, all the industries. Uh, similarly, so what we are doing is we are partnering with companies like Rockwell Automation that have uh, uh, the relationship with the operational uh, technology groups or the lines of businesses. So it's a partnership approach. In many cases, we have to touch the lines of businesses, multiple lines of businesses in many cases, and also the IT. So there's no single group that we can really work with for this area. All right. Keith, anything you add? Yeah, we, we also see a very similar partnership. Um, you know, I think... One of the, maybe one of the differences that's, that's taken place maybe over the last 18 months is that this is now top of mind for CIOs. 
And so where it was previously harder to be able to, to get a seat at the table to discuss these types of topics, I think it's become much easier now. And really, all the, the mandate of many CIOs is to be able to provide efficiency savings, productivity savings in a very short amount, uh, amount of time. So that's resulted in having a very captive audience. And what we've done uh, before and today, too, is, is you need to find a champion. I'll make that very clear. If you're a small 10-person company, trying to go change the world of how Chevron's gonna collect petrochemical information from its plants. You can go beat your head again and again and again until you find one person who really believes in it, right? So you gotta find that champion and then take it from there. That's, uh, that's another thing for startups to find an anchor in, within the large organization. And or scare them that they're going to become dinosaurs if they don't use this. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's true, that's true. Now, like I'm telling you, four years later now, it, as Keith just mentioned, it's a lot easier to, to get the mind share of these people. What kind of opportunities are there for startups? Lori, do you want to take a stab at that? If you're a startup in this whole IoT chain, where do you see some opportunities for startups? Yeah, so, so again, if I think about the case study that I described earlier, there was a lot of opportunity for smaller companies to play a role in the analytics piece of what we were doing. And uh, I, I think it came up in a talk earlier today in the room, um, you know, where you can develop really deep domain expertise to help provide that insight. I think that's a real opportunity. Another one is these are really complex um, integration problems. And so I think there is also an opportunity for um, people or companies that can come in and help with the integration problem. I think uh, there's another challenge in being able to connect devices. Uh, really, nothing happens unless you're able to start to bring data off of the machinery on the, on the manufacturing floor. So the ability to do that, many of these pieces of equipment are very old. And, uh, and so the ability to do that, and that's where the, the digitization process starts. And I would say that uh, even there's an opportunity just in focusing on manufacturing, but when you're able to start to digitize information, you can start to do more monitoring and diagnostics of, of different pieces of hardware. You're able to, as Lori mentioned, you're able to run analytics and, uh, and start to really look at the reliability of your operations. So there's a whole host of things that I think one area, that, that area, if you can target the digitization, really opens up a whole host of opportunities. So look, okay. I mean, this is an area with a huge, huge total addressable market. However, it is also an area that is hugely fragmented. So there is no single company that can, you know, however big they are, that can go after and, you know, play in the entire addressable market. So, you know, you have the IT companies that are focused on IT side of things, and then you have all these industrial automation companies uh, like Rockwell, Siemens, or Schneiders uh, of the world. There is always a gap between you know, these different companies, and there are gaps between the verticals. Those are huge opportunities for startups to go after. And obviously, you, know, you can look at either supply chain automation, or you could be looking at analytics, or you could push data to cloud and you know, push a lot of intelligence back to the OT and the factories. So there are huge opportunities. And this is also a market, I would say, that is growing at a tremendous pace. It's growing at a rate of like 35%, right? And it'll grow, grow at that pace for the next at least four to five years. Uh, so if you want to be in any area, I mean, this is an area for a startup to you know, really go after. I mean, given that our GDP is growing at only 2%, and this is growing like you know, 15 times more than that. I think, one or, I think the other thing as well is there's opportunity. There aren't that many players that are really going out, startup companies that are going after this space as well. And so one of the things to look at is where there's an opportunity. And as you said, this market's growing fast and there's not a lot of uh, vendors that are targeting it at this point. Yeah, Cisco, wait. so if I can add just one more point to that. So Cisco has funded some at least a dozen startups in this area. Right? So even though you know, we have our own IoT practice, we have you know, uh, IoT analytics, IoT infrastructure, but still, even with the engineering organization, broad and you know, deep engineering organization that we have within Cisco, we are not able to address all the spaces. So we are funding startups in this area. The point to note also here is that if you look at the IoT stack, right from the device to the protocols on the device, to the gateways, to the transport layer, to touching the cloud, to the analytics on the cloud, all of that. This, you know, we're talking about 
50 and 100 year old companies now suddenly wanting to adopt all of this stuff, right? So when you look at that, there's a complete, there's a big, big gap in trying to bring all this 50, 100 year old equipment, technology, protocol, modernize it with the cloud, what, you know, what we talk in the valley. And, uh, and uh, just pick which layer you want to be in, pick which verticals you want to be in, slice and dice it, find the matrix and the sweet spot, find the champion. Everybody says, I've got a great technology, and I, you know, who are you going to sell it to? And it's very hard unless you find that champion. So you know, the technology part alone is not going to win it. You're going to need some ecosystem, become Cisco's partner, become part of the Predix ecosystem, Intel's partnerships, you know, they all have ecosystems, alliances, etc. That will help get some visibility uh, for you. All right. Before I continue, we have six minutes. L just give me a show of hands if anybody has questions, so then I'll know how much time to save. There's one. Pardon me? They're in, they're in the, I don't have any app. Okay. You know, <laughs> it tells you how well I'm connected. There are questions? All right. So we'll take some audience questions before we go down so that uh, we can at least address these. Now I got to wear my glasses. Can we take few examples of real opportunities that will make this real for the audience in general? Can we take few examples of real opportunities? I can take one. I've done two startups in this space, so I'll take it uh, to start with, and then I'll tell you. Uh, in the, my company earlier than this, we saw a fabulous opportunity in optimizing usage of current. So real current, right? An aluminum smelter uses, four, for those of you that don't know, alum, uses 400,000 amperes of current on a regular basis. The, their price for power is less than half of what you pay, you and I pay. You will always see an aluminum plant next, uh, next to a power plant. It consumes more energy than all of France on a global basis, emits more greenhouse gases than all of Germany on a glo global basis. That's how wasteful that industry is. So if you could, we spotted an opportunity to improve the current usage by 1%. We went after it, that's what we did because it was very hard for the regular process control guys to think that way, that we can do all this cloud analytics, collect data so, free, so fast and do it. The second thing that we did with my current company, we found a hole in the transport layer, which is a horizontal layer across every industrial vertical. Think about it. Every single old industrial company, because of IoT, will need a mini Cisco in-house. There's a huge gap in networking. That's what we picked. We put up a horizontal solution. We solved it for all of them. Now we're going, you know, we're very well adopted so far in that space. But those are some specific examples. Any other examples that you would like to cite? Yeah, so let me give a couple of examples. Um, so how many of you read about, how many of you are aware of this water contamination problem in Flint? Show of hands, please. Right? So. If you have an aqua sensor that can sense and measure the quality of water, measure the quality of any, and measure the extent of contamination, and send the data for analysis, and drive some real-time communication about that, you could prevent a huge disaster like that. Right? And similarly, I mean, there is a bridge that collapsed in Minneapolis maybe four years back or five years back. Right? So today, you can attach sensors to these bridges that can measure the vibration, that can measure the rigidity and the stability of these bridges, and can send real-time data, and can provide warnings. Right? So you have many real-life applications that can go a long way in uh, utilizing the power of this technology and making life better for everyone. Right? So, so let me add on to that just briefly. So um, you know, one of the, the days of sort of client-server software are, are really obviously on the way out. And so we have a, a cloud platform called Predix, and uh, we invite developers to be able to write code, write applications that leverage our Predix infrastructure. So you have the ability to go in and write analytics. So write analytics that measure vibrations and temperature and pressure on these manufacturing devices and determine when they're going to fail. So you, have the, you don't need to write everything from scratch. You can leverage what's there, and you can use our cloud platform to to be able to write additional functionality on top of it. 
So how willing is cooperation between yeah. yourselves as yeah, so we, we, I, I think there is a lot of movement toward cooperation. And in fact, the three companies up here helped found the Industrial Internet Consortium exactly to foster that kind of cooperation. And as Ron Thanks, mentioned, I think all of us also have partner programs. We have an IoT Solutions Alliance, uh, which is a really great way for smaller com companies, especially to plug into what we're doing. Yeah, I don't know anything to add. I, I agree. I mean, we all see it as really an ecosystem play that there's not one vendor that's going to provide the solutions, but everyone has their own capabilities, strengths that they bring to the table. And our, our strategy is to be able to provide an environment that, that uh, our partners as well as outside developers can provide their solutions. I think it also goes beyond the tech companies, right? So like I said earlier, it also goes to, you know, extending the ecosystem to industrial automation companies, especially you know, in this uh, uh, area of smart, uh, smart factories. Wonderful. One last question, and then we're, it's time. And it's, it, there were two or three people who asked this. How will IoT impact the workforce and jobs? So now you're going to play economist, and you're going to tell, give an opinion on how will IoT impact workforce and jobs. <laughs> Anybody wants to take a crack at it? Lovely. I get to go first. Okay. <laughs> Well, it, it is really, really interesting. One of the stats that I, I pulled, actually, as I was uh, preparing for this is the increased use of robotics in factories. And that's going to have a, uh, an impact of a 16% workforce reduction you know, by 2025. So there is that element. But I think it, it's kind of it, the analogy that sort of pops into my head is when we first started looking at virtualization in data centers, we were really worried we wouldn't sell as many uh, server chips. And we've actually ended up selling more. Uh, and I think we're going to see some of the same phenomenon here. As we increase productivity and automation, the jobs will be different. But I, I'm not sure that it's going to be. I, I actually think it'll end up being net positive. Yes. I, that's, I think that's, that's very well said. I think you know, one of the things, going to your earlier point, is we've seen uh, some of the companies are, are they're adding jobs instead of robots. And they're adding people to work uh, collaboratively with robots. So that's changing. That's something that didn't used to exist. So there's opportunity there. I think also, now that you have much more access to data across the manufacturing environment, that provides opportunity. And that opportunity never existed before. Yeah, I mean, especially in the factory environments, uh, certainly the knowledge and skill levels are going to change. The required skills will change. And there will be more and more knowledge workers in the factories. So, you know, that's, that's something that will certainly change. And like Lori said earlier, that may have some impact in terms of the, you know, current workforce you have versus the workforce that you need. Tell you what, invent a game that will teach a two-year-old how to code. That's what's needed. All right, big idea. Think about it. Anyway, I think we're done with time. Thank you so much for being here and listening to us. Please give a big hand to the audience. Thank you. Thank you.